In this video, we'll take advantage of Gauss's law and our knowledge of electric fields to study what happens to conductors in equilibrium. The most important thing to remember about conductors in equilibrium, now, I said equilibrium, we're talking about static charges. We're not talking about hooking this up to a battery or something that's putting energy into it with some sort of varying field. We're talking about electrostatics. You put the charge on, you let them sit there. They have not accelerated anymore. They're setting up. What do we see from the field? Here's what we find out. In that condition, the electric field is zero inside a perfect conductor. For us, as far as we're concerned, all our conductors are perfect conductors. This is kind of like, you know, neglecting friction and some other things. Actually, all conductors have some resistance we're going to find out. That is, they don't just let all charge move evenly and easily. There's some resistance to the charge moving, but we're going to think that it's perfect and there's none. Now, if that wasn't the case, let's say that there was an electric field right here. And there was a charge there. That charge would pick up speed. It would accelerate. And if that electric field, let's say, kept going around, it'd have to do something, right? Then, in theory, the charge could pick up more and more and more and more speed. And therefore gain more and more energy. But where's it getting that energy from? Okay. The point being that we're not letting it have any energy. So that means it can't do that. So that's why you can't have an electric field inside because as soon as you put the charges on there, whatever charges you had, those charges would want to get away from each other. And there's not going to be a field inside the conductor. So this is a huge, huge, huge important point. Now, by Gauss's law, that tells us something else. The net charge must be on the surface of the conductor. Gauss's law says that this flux in here, which remember is related to some sort of summation of the electric field dotted into our little areas, is equal to the enclosed charge over epsilon naught. But we just said that there is no electric field. If there's no electric field, there can't be any enclosed charge. So if you draw a Gaussian surface in here, because the little charges themselves are going to want to go to the outside, like that, You'll have no enclosed charge. They're trying to get away from each other. Think of them as little positive charges. Plus, plus. And they, they're feeling the repulsive force. So they've moved as far away. They can't leave the surface because they're being held by the electrons and such there. But they move through the conductor to the outside. Inside of any Gaussian surface, there is no charge. And consequently, there is no electric field. Now what about the electric field outside the conductor? Can you have an electric field out there? Yes, you can. But the conductor sets some requirements on it as well. The electric field outside of a conductor has to be perpendicular to the surface of the conductor. And furthermore, the magnitude of the electric field is uniform. That is, it's constant, and it's given by the value sigma over epsilon naught. Now, what is that sigma? Sigma is Q over area. Okay, that's area. That's charge. Now, let me show you why this has to be true. Let's assume for a minute that we had electric fields that were not perpendicular to the surface. If that was true, then the electric field would have a component like this, call that E perpendicular. And it would have a component like this, which would be E parallel to the surface. 
But that means that there was a charge here, it would experience a force in that direction. And because this is a conductor, it could pick up speed again, like I said, and go all the way around and keep going faster and faster and faster and faster and faster, getting more and more energy. Where is the energy coming from? You can't just get something for nothing. All right. So it can't do this. If the electric field is perpendicular, it has to leave the conductor. Well, leaving a conductor means that's not a conducting surface. So there's something holding it, binding the electrons to the atoms, of course. But in the conductor, they're allowed to share the electrons. So if it goes this way, it would be able to become a huge current. So you would have this infinite, what we're going to call currents in the next chapter, current. The charges will be able to go around and round and round, and that can't happen. So what happens is when you put charge on a conductor, the charge will spread out. And for a fraction of a second, everything's moving and there are currents. I mean, fraction of a second, like 10 to the minus 12 seconds. And it's very, very soon, the charges will spread out in such a way that they cancel any of the components of the electric field along the surface that is parallel. Oops, that's not good. Got to be able to draw it perpendicular. And in each case, not the best drawing in the world, but in each case, the electric field must be perpendicular to the surface. So the only force that would be occurred if you put a positive charge on that surface is to push, try to push it off the surface, not along it. That's a static condition. And we can tell you the amount. If you increase the charge, you'll increase the electric field. Now for something like this, that's R. Now let's see, let's use our formula up there. If that's, say, big R, then it says that the electric field should be equal to this Q over big R, 4 pi R squared, epsilon naught. But that's just 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught, that's K. Q over R squared, and we're getting back to our little formula that we got earlier for a point or spherical charge. So you see there's consistency between using Gauss's law and what you remember for a point charge. If you got something that you know the answer to, it's great to be able to write it quickly. If you don't, you have to use Gauss's law. We use conductors to shape the fields. All right. What I mean by that, we can build electric lenses. Inside nuclear accelerators, for instance, you will have systems that look something like this. There will be a metal, and the metal might look like this. We can cut that conductor to a shape. Now what does that mean? That means if I put charges to it, there is a field line like this, and a field like that and a field like this, and a field like this. And out here the field is down and the field is up. We are actually changing the shape of the field and hence the direction of the force by cutting the metal. Alright, so that's our conductor. That's a conductor in an accelerator. This does two things. If you take a positive charge and you send it in like this, as that charge comes in, let's say there's more than one, there's a bunch of them here, those charges experience an inward force that bunches them up. This inward, inward E acts to focus. It's a lens. We're going to learn about 
other lenses like glass lenses later on, but it's a lens like on a camera. On the other hand, as it gets in here, you see this thing still has a component pushing inward all right like this, but it also has a component this away. This makes it speed up. So the components this away accelerate particles to make them speed up. So by shaping the metal, I can change how it focuses and how it speeds up the particles. In other words, I can manipulate the force. This shaping of a surface, we do this with glass as well. We'll learn later how we can shape the surface to deal with the index of refraction in Snell's law. That is to change the angle that we get of refraction in lenses. Or we can shape it to change the angle of reflection in mirrors. So this is a reason the conductors are so important to us. We know how the electric field lines look, and therefore we can manipulate them to build things for engineering applications. Another thing that's neat about these things, if you have an irregular shaped conductors, something like a point, we're going to find out later when we study about electrical potential that the charge builds up near these sharp points and is more spread out around the bigger rounded edge. Now what that means is because they build up, they're more likely to jump off. Now you might like this because you might want to have a way to spray charges. So it can act as a charge source. They do that in spark plugs. The charges jump across and in the process ignite gasoline causing your engine to go. You can do this as a way to get an electron beam years ago in old television sets. Today we're using other methods to get the electrons to jump out. However, in addition to throwing charges this way, it can also attract charges. This is called a lightning rod, and on most buildings there will be a sharp spike, and that spike will be attached to the building or through a rod, and then there will be a wire that goes down into the ground. And when lightning, which is electrical charges, come in, they can go down this metal and into the ground and not into the building. If they go into the building because the building is not a conductor, they'll cause heating and that heating costs fire and it burns down your house, your building. So for instance, side building Tarleton has all sorts of these stuck all around it and driven into the ground to protect it from lightning strikes. By the way, this also tells you if you're building an electrical device, you want to be careful about screws because these sharp edges can cause arcing and sparks. So you don't want to put sharp edges. You want flat or countersunk screws. You don't want sharp sheet metal type screws. These are just some of the things that engineers and physicists have to deal with. All right, we'll talk to you on another video.